Hi, I'm Jennifer Benson, State Director at AARP Massachusetts. We're here today to answer your questions about Social Security. AARP knows that you work hard and pay into Social Security, so it's only fair for you to expect to get the money you've earned. We know Social Security can be confusing, so we're here today to offer our expertise on any questions you may have. This Teletown Hall is hosted by AARP Massachusetts, and I'm pleased to welcome our special guest, Kevin Reno. He's the Regional Public Affairs Specialist for the Social Security Administration. Again, I want to thank you for joining us today and for an informational session to help you understand Social Security. You've earned uh, the Social Security you've earned and the challenges facing the program long term. This is an interactive event, and after a brief statement from our special guest, we'll be happy to take your questions live on the air. AARP has been fighting to ensure Americans get the Social Security they've earned for decades, and we can answer important questions that should help you when you want to claim your Social Security. Some questions we hear often and can answer today, when should you claim? How can you maximize your money? How much will you get? What kind of long-term challenges does Social Security face? This is your chance to hear from and ask questions of Social Security Administration Regional Public Affairs Specialist Kevin Reno. If you would like to ask a question at any time during the call, please press star 3 on your telephone keypad to be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and question and place you in the queue. The sooner you press star three, the sooner you will be online with our guest. Now that you've received some initial information, let's jump into the discussion with our expert. As you are all thinking of your questions, I'll introduce our speaker. Kevin Reno is the Regional Public Affairs Specialist for the Social Security Administration in New England. He began his career with SSA in 2005 as a claims representative in the Dorchester, Massachusetts District Office, and since that time has worked in several uh, different management and staff positions in the Boston area. A native New Englander, Reno received a bachelor's degree in history from Stonehill College in Easton, Massachusetts, and a graduate degree in gerontology from the University of Massachusetts Boston campus. As regional public affairs specialist, Reno is responsible for coordinating and, uh, the Social Security Administration's public affairs and public information activities in the six New England states. He has been particularly active in spearheading the agency's efforts to educate the American public about Social Security. Hey, Kevin, thanks again for joining us. The floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here today. I'm really looking forward to the, to the questions that we get today. You know, I love uh, doing these kind of Q&A forums because it just gives me the chance uh, to talk to people about the job I've been working in for almost 20 years. And there's a lot of misinformation or confused information about the types of benefits that we offer. So I love these opportunities to get out and just really talk about what Social Security can do for you uh, and how we can help you. So I, I understand we have a, a few people in the queue already. I won't talk too much longer. Let's just get right into this and start answering some questions. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, for folks who have just joined our call, this is your chance to hear from and ask questions of Kevin Reno from the Social Security Administration. You. Um, uh, and to hear about Social Security you, that you've earned and the challenges facing the program long term. This is interactive, so if you'd like to ask a question at any time, press star 3 on your keypad, and you will be connected with ARP staff members who will note your name and your question and place you in the queue. The sooner you press star 3, the sooner you get to ask your question. Uh, Hey, um, let's start with a leading question as we have folks just getting started in our queue. Um, Kevin, tell me, um, we have a couple minutes. What's one of the biggest myths that you hear about Social Security? That it'll be gone. 
<laughs> uh, but actually, before we get into that, and I'll, I'll circle back to that in just a moment. But since we have everybody on the line, I would just like to remind everybody this is a public event. This is on Facebook. This is over the phone. You have a lot of people listening in, so I'm happy to answer any and all questions. I would just caution you don't want to be throwing out your personal identifiable information on this call. So no social security numbers, please. No dates of birth. Um, I'll provide you with my contact information at the end of the call today. So if you have a question that really involves me to really look into your case, um, I'll give you out my email address uh, and we can, we can work it through like that. But please, please, please uh, don't, um, don't put your personal information out on this call, uh, just for your own, for your own safety. Um, so uh, yeah, the biggest myth we have is that Social Security is going to dry up. I'm sure many of you have heard, seen in the news, uh, that the trust fund faces a depletion issue uh, that they anticipate really coming to fruition in and around 2033, 2034. Depletion does not mean Social Security is going to disappear. As long as we have workers, you'll have Social Security because that's how the system works. The workers of today pay for the retirees of today. What 2033, 2034 is telling you is because of how the math is going to work, because of the number of retirees against the number of workers, we're just not going to be able to pay, potentially pay out a full benefit at that time. And what they're estimating right now, and this is kind of a moving target, year over year it changes, but what they're estimating right now is by 2033, 2034, given if, if the structure of the agency remains the same, we'd only be able to pay out about 80% of any given check. Now, this isn't to alarm you. This is out in the news. It's, it's, it's been reported on at length. But it isn't the first time we've faced this. Uh, the Social Security Administration faced the same issue back in 1983. And at that time, they passed the Social Security, Social Security Amendments Act, which shored up our funding for well, another 40-some-odd years. And most likely, that will end up happening with this. Between now and 2033, 2034, whatever date it becomes, you know, uh, Congress will take some form of action to shore up our trust fund. So that is probably the biggest myth that we hear day in and day out. You know, it's going to be gone. It'll disappear. And it's just not true. It won't. Uh, it'll just be potentially depleted. And I, don't, I do not foresee that actually happening. So that's the biggest myth I've seen. Great. Thanks for that. And I know we've all heard about that. Um, and so thanks for clearing that up and giving some really good information. I see we have a growing list in the queue. Um, Ted, who do we have who'd like to ask a question? Hey, why don't we start out with Donna? She's calling us from Pittsburgh. Hello, Donna. Donna? I said hello. Hi, Donna. How are hey, you doing? we got How you, Donna. You? Okay. Hi. What's your question, Donna? My question is, I'm already receiving um, Social Security, but I am also receiving a pension from Middlesex County Retirement. Mm-hmm. And because of my Middlesex County retirement pension, I've been forfeited part of what I should have gotten for my Social Security. Uh, by about two-thirds, I've been forfeited what I should have collected for Social Security. So my question is, what is being done to rectify collecting what you really earned for Social Security. For myself and many people out there just like me that have worked, um, you know, uh, municipal type sure. job. Absolutely. All right, so we're jumping right into the deep end. First question, I love it. All right, so what, what Don is talking about, for those of you who may not know, uh, for individuals who have what are considered non-covered pensions. So up here in Massachusetts, that's traditionally going to be, and Donna, stop me if I'm, I'm off, off base here, but that's traditionally going to be your teachers, your firefighters, your policemen. They do not pay FICA. They do not pay into the Federal Insurance Contribution Act as part of their general salary. Okay, And so right. because of that, when they go to collect their Social Security, they're impacted by something called the Windfall Elimination Provision. And actually... Uh, a minute ago, I had referenced the 1983 Social Security Amendments Act. The windfall was a direct result of that act. 
And what it does is it offsets that individual's payment by essentially that state pension. So to your question of what is being done about it, well, I can't really speak to be what is being done about it. And the reason for that is the implementation of the WEP and any changes that would come to it or for it is actually a legislative thing. So, you know, Congress enacted this into law back in 83 with the Amendments Act. If anything were to change for it, say the structure, the math, how it is applied, that would have to be done at a legislative level. So your reps would have to change how the law currently is. And then once they do, or if they do, then people like myself would go out and educate the public about that change. But until something is done at that level, the windfall would remain as it is. Um, if you're interested in, and I, you know, as, a, as, a, as an agency representative, I, I do not uh, promote any particular stance on this. I just, I just inform you of what uh, kind of the rules and regs are, but I do know if you are interested in potentially looking into some proposed changes, I believe Representative Neal here in Massachusetts has uh, some ideas on the windfall that he would like to see implemented. I know for a fact Representative Larson in Connecticut, his Social Security 21, I believe it's the 2100 plan, uh, mentioned some changes to the windfall that he would like to see implemented. There is a rep or a senator in Texas whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, who also I believe has some changes. So you could certainly look up those uh, representatives uh, to see what they are proposing for changes. But ultimately for us, from a social security standpoint, until something is legislated, until it is the law of the land, we work with what is on the books at the moment. So what is being done about it for us at a social security level? Nothing at the moment because no new law has been passed with regards to it. I can tell you, Donna, um, thank you for your question. AARP in the past has supported legislation to make that change um, at the federal level in Congress. So um, I, you know, that's the history for us and it has to be changed at a congressional level. I too fall into the same category as you. Um, and so it's something that I'm watching as well. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you for the answer. Thank you. Ted, who do we have next? Why don't we go to Raymond? He's calling from Salz. He's calling us from Salzburg today. Hello, Raymond. Actually, it's Joanne. His Hi. wife is on the line. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. No, my question was actually the same question um, because my husband got his quarters in the private sector before he went into teaching. And then when he taught, he wasn't he wasn't able to get full retirement from teaching because he didn't have enough years left to work. So he only gets a partial from his teaching, and he and they took forty percent of his social security. And we are and I, I heard what you just said about the legislation, but we are on, we are one of only eight states in the union mm -hmm. where this exists, and that doesn't make any sense. The rationale behind that was when they changed the law back in 83, they basically said, and, and, and funnily enough, uh, employees at Social Security at that time, back then, guess what? They didn't pay into Social Security themselves. They were civil service employees. So if you're talking about federal employees, 80, I think they, they pushed it out a little bit, 86 back, they didn't pay into Social Security either. Um, but when they changed the law at the municipal level and at the state level, I believe they said to the states, listen, it's optional. If you want to start paying in, you, you can. You don't have to. But if you don't, when your employees begin to attempt to take their benefit, they are going to be impacted by either the windfall or you know, the government pension offset if you're talking about spousal benefits. So there are a few, Massachusetts being one of them, states throughout the country who fall into this category. There are not a lot. As you said, I think you said eight. I don't know the exact number, so you know a little more educated on that than I am. But yeah, it wasn't a unilateral blanket law that they passed. There was some flexibility there for the states to kind of say, do you want to opt in? But if you don't, you're going to have to deal. You're, 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 the people who get your benefits will have to, will have to deal with this windfall. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, can you tell me, um, I didn't catch the name of the representative you said in Massachusetts that is trying to get it changed. I believe it's Representative Neal. Neal? 
Neil. Could you spell it for me? I'm sorry. I believe he spells it N E A L, but I will N-E-A-L. defer oh, okay. anyone else Neil. who knows any differently. I know definitively that Rep. Larson out of Connecticut has a very robust section in his in his legislation uh, to change it. But um, you know, I believe it's Representative Neal here in Massachusetts. Okay. Do you have any idea how I would get in touch with either of these men? To get in touch with the representative, if you uh, go to Google or your preferred search engine and just type in uh, Rep. Neal, Rep. Rep. Larson, you're going to oh, get okay. the first search engine that's yep. going to come up is their web pages. Uh, they have staffers who will be more than happy to answer your questions with regards to their boss's stance on this. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanne. And Ted, who's our next uh, next caller? Let's go to Albert, who is calling from Metfield. Hello, Albert. Hello there. <laughs> I, should I just go right ahead? <laughs> That's my question. Yeah. yeah. Go okay. for it. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, uh, we have a theme going here. This is a another WEP related question. And, okay. Um, it has to do with uh, spousal survivor benefits and how uh, they might be affected by the WEP. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, I was a public school um, employee for most of my career, but did did qualify for uh, Social Security for uh, a few other jobs that was um, – about 50% impacted, maybe a little bit more. My wife was Social Security uh, and did get, uh, you know, a, a good payment from that. She passed away, and now I want to look into the spousal survivor benefits. Mm-hmm. And the, the two things I'm wondering are, one, w- you know, if it looks like I'm eligible for something you know, because her payments were, were greater, does the WEP go over and impact <laughs> how much the payment might be from uh, uh, her her benefits? And then I, I guess the second thing, if there's any guideline as far as how long you know, this uh, process takes to sort out these days. Thank you. First off, Albert, I'm very sorry to hear about your wife. Thank you. Um, Secondly, great question, and thank you very much for asking it. Um, So there's a couple things here. When you're talking about the windfall, remember this. Windfall impacts your ability to draw your benefits, so from the work you did, paying into Social Security, and that is it, hard stop. Windfall only impacts your ability to draw your benefit. Now, what you would be referring to is actually the government pension offset. It's kind of the flip side of the windfall, windfall coin. When government pension offset is applied when someone who has a non-covered pension, like you do, attempts to draw a benefit from a spouse who, in, in the similar to your scenario, is eligible for Social Security. Okay? Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll start with the high-level stuff. Windfall impacts your ability to draw your benefits only. So windfall would not apply when you're trying to take your spousal benefit, to you getting that benefit. But government pension offset would, and how government pension offset would work, on your wife's passing, you're eligible, theoretically, for 100% of whatever it is she was eligible for, assuming you're at full retirement age, okay? If you're not at full retirement age, it's going to be reduced a little, but let's just assume you are at full retirement age. So you're eligible for 100% of her benefit. But because you get that non-covered pension, what we then need to do is take two-thirds your gross monthly non-covered pension value and subtract that from whatever it is you would have been eligible for from your spouse. So let's say from your spouse you're eligible for $1,000, okay? Mm-hmm. And two-thirds your non-covered pension is $800, at the end of the day, we'd do all the math, and you would walk away with a Social Security spousal survivor's benefit of $200. 1,000 minus 800 equals the two. Mm-hmm. 
Now, let's say two-thirds your non-covered pension is greater than whatever it is you would get from your spouse's benefit. Let's say the benefit's 1000 and two-thirds your pension is 1200 In that instance there, you would not be eligible for a spousal benefit from us, okay? So that's called the government pension offset. Okay, very good. All right, so if it turned out that the math didn't <laughs> work out so it was to my benefit to claim that, could I just not claim it and just continue with my own payment? Certainly, absolutely. The other thing you would want to look into in this instance is uh, the one thing you would be eligible for that would not be touched by any of this is the one-time lump sum survivor's benefits, a one-time payment of $255. Um, okay. You can certainly claim that. Uh, did none of this pension stuff has any bearing on that whatsoever. Um, she was eligible as long as she had her quarters, which she clearly did. Um, you'd be eligible for that. So what the what the metric you need to figure out here, and you can contact your local office, and they can help you with the math if you'd like. Um, but you just need to figure out two thirds the value of your gross monthly pension, not what you walk away with, but the gross. Two thirds of so gross. Any withdrawals gross. from it, the, you know, the total value. Two thirds of that, if that's going to be more or less than whatever you're going to get uh, from the, the spousal benefit. And again, if it's less, you get the difference between you, that spousal benefit, the widow's benefit in this instance actually, and two thirds your gross monthly pension amount. You get the difference between the two. Um, so I, I would probably recommend you can call our 800 number, 1 um, 800 772 1213. They can help you out with that, or your local office. Medfield, I'm not sure what your local office is. Norwood. Norwood. Norwood, okay. It's so very you got Norwood that you can contact. Yeah. I can. You can contact it's them, and they can just let you know. Just know your amount. They can do the math for you and figure it out. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> I thank you. You've explained it very clearly and helpfully. <laughs> I just wish that two thirds was such a large number, but that's nothing to do with you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your help. Appreciate that. No worries. Be well. Yeah, bye. Thanks, Albert. I just want to take a moment if you've just joined our call. Um, I'm Jen Benson uh, from ARP Massachusetts, and this is your chance to hear from and ask questions of Kevin Reno, Regional Public Affairs Specialist for the Social Security Administration, about the Social Security you've earned and the challenges facing the program long term. This is an interactive call. So if you'd like to ask a question at any time during the call, just press star three on your telephone keypad to be connected with an ARP staff member who will note your name, your question, and place you in the queue. Just press star three and you can get online to ask your questions. You'll be placed in the queue. Thank you so much. Ted, who do we have next? Why don't we go to Donald? He's calling us from North Grafton. Hello, Donald. Hello. Hi, Donald. Hello. How are you? My my question is, is the Social, Social Security Lockbox Act a legitimate item? I, Donald, could you give me more information on the Lockbox block box Act? I don't know if I've heard of that. Well, uh, I keep getting stuff in the mail. They're looking for donations to to maintain this. What it's supposed to be, according to the information that comes with it, is to stop the legislation from taking money out of the Social Security fund, and um, in, in essence, have it in the lockbox so they they can't get at it and just put in IOUs. Well, Donald, this sounds like something that would be like a pre-legislative thing. This sounds like an act someone is trying to pass uh, in order to either maybe shore up solvency or address some type of issue that they perceive. So I can't actually speak to that because, remember, I can't speak to things that have not been signed into law yet. So if somebody is percolating about some type of change to what we do but it hasn't been signed into law yet, I can't speak to it. However, you did make me think of something that's very important, and I, and I want to thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> A lot of stuff is sent out in our name, asking you to do all sorts of things. You must, I, I strongly encourage you to be on the lookout for Social Security-related fraud. 
Okay, and this can come in many forms. Emails, phone calls, regular mail, um, anything sent from us. Any website that you are to go to that is Social Security related will always, always end in a .gov email address. Now, recently you may have been notified if you had a My Social Security account that the login information you had needed to be changed, and that actually did point you to a .me email address or a website address. However, the first site it pointed you to was a .gov, and then from there you were directed to the login dot, uh, login.me, which actually, now that I think of it, also may have ended in a .gov, so I'm going to retract that statement. But our online presence always ends in a .gov. So if you are on socialsecurity.com, .tv, .eu, .whatever, it is not us. Do not reply. Secondly, you always, always, always have due process. So if you get a letter from us saying, hey, Social Security is going to suspend your Social Security card because we need you to pay us $2,000 immediately. First off, we can never suspend your Social Security number. It's yours for forever. We can never take it away from you, ever. Secondly, you are afforded due process anytime we make the most minute change to your record. So if you get a letter saying you owe us money, and you might, you're also in that letter going to get a bunch of paragraphs that say you owe us money. But if you disagree, you have the right to appeal this via several forms. So if you get correspondence like that, that is most likely fraud. If you're questioning it, my recommendation is go to our website, socialsecurity.gov, or our 800 number, 800-772-1213, or your local office, and just give them a ring and say, hey, I got this kind of weird letter. Is this on the, on the level? And they'll let you know, yeah, yeah, well, unfortunately, you owe us X amount of dollars, or no, nope, this, this isn't on the level. Uh, and then the last thing I'll end with the fraud thing is we will never – ever, ever ask you for a gift card. We will never ask you for anything like that. Again, you are always afforded due process with anything that you do with us. So we're never going to ask you for a gift card. We're never going to suspend your Social Security number. We can't do it. Okay? And we're always going to give you the right to appeal any decision, positive or negative, that we make on your record. So I appreciate the question because it allowed me to touch upon the, the fraud issue. Um, I, I don't think I can speak to this lockbox uh, legislation. I'm not familiar with it. I don't believe it is active policy, um, so I, I, I wouldn't want to wade in onto what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, thank you. That's really important information, and I'm going to give everyone a heads up to get their pen. Could you give that number, that phone number again? Uh, because I think that's critical information for, for people to have. If you are asked to send money and you want to confirm that this is legit and not fraud, um, what's that number people can call? So our national 800 number is going to be 800-772-1213. And the website Excellent. is going to be socialsecurity.gov. Excellent. Excellent. So that is really important. This is an area I know that is ripe for fraud. Uh, and so everyone should confirm that any question, any ask for funding around Social Security, please make sure that this is a legitimate ask and confirm it with the Social Security Administration. Thank you. And remember, if you'd like to ask a question, don't forget, star three will get you into the queue. Um, star three on your phone's keypad will get you into the queue with Kevin Reno from the Social Security Administration. Ted, who's our next call? Let's go to Brian. He's calling us from Holliston. Hello, Brian. Oh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I know there's a line, so I'll be quick. Um, I'm... Um, uh, a widower um, with two teenage children, and um, I'm collecting Social Security, my deceased wife's Social Security for my two kids. Um, my question is, how long does that last for? And then when that stops, can I continue to collect her Social Security for myself? 
Excellent. Thank you, Brent. That is an excellent question. First off, I'm sorry to hear of your loss. Thank you. Um, I believe it's been a while since I have done a children's claim. Um, let's see. I believe they can continue to receive the benefits up until 18. Um, okay. And then at 18, if they are still a full-time student in, a, in an accredited high school, then they can make, stay on the benefit until they either graduate or turn 19, in whichever event occurs first, and then they will come off of the benefit. And what happens is, I don't know the ages of your children, but essentially, let's say you had like an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old. So the 18-year-old comes off, that value gets added to the 16, because at the end of the day, that benefit is just divided by the number of active children on the record. So the 16-year-old would see a bump in their payment. At the end of the day, you're going to walk away with the same sum of money, okay? Um, and then when the, that 16-year-old turns 18, the benefit would stop. You okay, would not so when, be able to continue to get a benefit at that point for the children. Okay. So when when my son graduates high school, his benefit would transfer over to my daughter's benefit? Essentially. So let's say the total benefit was $500 between the two of them. So they're each yep. getting what, 250 right? All right. When yep. your oldest graduates, the youngest would go from getting 250 to 500 Got it. And Until then when that child turned. graduates, the, correct. And then when that child graduates, the benefit would go to zero. Now, in the instance, though, that one of your children or either of your children, or if we're talking just in generalities of children's benefits, if a child is disabled, they can apply for, at the age of 18, uh, basically uh, disability benefits for children. And if they are approved, they could continue to get that benefit from the deceased parent potentially forever, you know, depending on as long as they continue to meet that disability requirement. That's the only way a child post-18 can continue to collect a parent's benefit. Now, with regard to yourself, you had said, is there any way you can get the benefit? Um, are you at or anywhere near retirement age? Um, I have about another 10, 10. Yeah, so um, yeah, about eight years. Okay. The only way you could file for spousal benefits, in this instance, widow's benefits, in your 50s, is if you have a disability yourself, as a disability that it would qualify for us. In that instance there, if you were anywhere from 50 to 50, uh, up until 62, 50 to 59, you can apply for um, disabled, uh, spousal benefits as a disabled spouse. Um, okay. But it would have to be a disability based on our criteria. Once you hit 60, you can potentially file for widow's benefits. It's considered early, like super early retirement at that point. Um, it would be reduced, whatever you're eligible for, from, from your spouse. And the other thing you would have to contend with is if you are actively working at 60, there's earnings all sorts of earnings restrictions that you would have to, if you are above, there may be no value in you applying. Okay. And if I were to get remarried, I'm assuming those benefits would, would, would be not be available. Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Bye-bye. Excellent. Thanks for the call. Ted, who do we have next? Let's go to Anne-Marie. She's calling us from Pittsburgh. Hello, Anne-Marie. Hello. Hi, Anne-Marie. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I... I'm curious. I'm 65 years old. My husband is 77 years old. We're both currently receiving Social Security. But when he applied, I was told that I could apply on his if it would be greater, that I could yeah. receive benefits through him. It's not. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm receiving my own. But I'm curious, is the reverse true? Could he get an increased benefit by going through my earnings? That is a great question, Anne-Marie. Um, at, at this point, it would be purely hypothetical because if he's been getting benefits for so long, he would not be able to withdraw his own claim. Well, he would not be able to withdraw his own claim to back down to your benefit, even if he could. Back in 2015, they passed a new law called the Bipartisan Budget Act. Uh, well, pardon me. Uh, the, the Bipartisan Budget Act was passed. It was part of some omnibus bill or something like that. But it instituted this, this concept called deemed filing which was basically that 
if and when you come in to apply, you have to apply for any and all benefits that you are eligible for. So let's say your husband had walked in and attempted to apply just for your benefit and was going to allow, you know, leave his benefit alone to continue to accrue value, and then he would take it later on. Uh-huh. That he wouldn't have been able to do so because they would say, listen, before you can even touch your spousal benefit, you have to apply for your own first. And in this scenario, the value of his would be so much greater than yours, it would negate him applying for yours. Okay. And you're saying due to the length of time he's been receiving benefit that it's no longer even eligible? Is that my, my understanding? You can, only withdraw a claim. you can only withdraw a claim after a year. And if you do, you have to repay everything that you repaid you. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he's far greater out than a year. Uh, yeah, so he yeah. wouldn't be able to do that. And even if he could, he'd still run into this deemed filing. So okay. if he tried to just get yours and leave his, it wouldn't work. There's only two instances now when deemed filing doesn't apply. It's if you were born before January 1st of 1954. So if you were born before January 1st of 1954, you were grandfathered into the old provisions of the law, which under that model, you could have come in and just applied for your spousal benefit and left yours alone. If you wow. were born after January 1st of 1954, the only way you can still do this kind of picking and choosing between a benefit is if you are a widow okay. or a widower. So if you're in that scenario, you can pick and choose still. Well, he does qualify by that um, cutoff date, so he is grandfathered in. But a uh, curious situation, he actually was mandated by the doctor to go out on disability, and therefore he applied through disability and then automatically rolled to his. It didn't give the option. Is there a... Mm, uh, you know, is there any? Yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying, but no. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate no your problem. time. It was a good question, for, a good answer. Was, Thank you. It was a great question, too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank everyone for being on the line. If you're still looking to get in the queue to ask questions, we still have time left. Don't forget, star three gets you in the queue to talk with Kevin Reno from the Social Security Administration. He's here to an answer your questions about your earned Social Security, um, everything from when you should uh, start taking it, uh, what's best for you. Uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, please get in the queue and ask your question. Ted, what do we have next in line? Let's go to Cynthia. She's calling from Lemonster. Hello, Cynthia. Hi. Yes. Uh, I'm calling because my husband um, was 63 when he passed away. And I've been um, a teacher for many years, and I'm, I'm, I've retired now. But um, because I'm a teacher and I work for the town, I never – put into Social Security, not not that much. But my mm -hmm. husband is Social Security, but he was not able to collect on it. I just wanted to know, I was told that if I, if I do my pension, I couldn't tap into his Social Security, and that didn't make any sense to me. Sure, thank because you. Great question. Things. Oh, go ahead. Uh, um, you can. It's not that you can't. What's going to happen is you're going to run against something called the government pension offset. Okay. So as his spouse, you are potentially eligible for his benefits since he has unfortunately passed away. The starting math we're going to use is you're going to be eligible for roughly 100% of whatever it was he was eligible for. Okay. Yeah. But what happens in your scenario is we figure out what you'd be eligible for in a widow's benefit. Okay, and then we're going to ask you, well, what is two-thirds your gross monthly pension amount from the state? And whatever that value is, we subtract that from your Social Security widow's benefit, and you are paid the difference. So if your Social Security's widow's benefit was $1,000 and two-thirds your state pension was 800 
you'd walk away with a Social Security widow's benefit of $200. However, and this is probably, I think, what people may have been alluding to, you, alluding to when they said you'd never get it, in a lot of instances in which you've had an individual who's only ever worked for the state, their pension is usually significant. And so two-thirds that gross monthly pension amount exceeds, is greater than, the benefit you would get from your spouse. And when that Correct. math works out, you do not get the spousal benefit from us. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, um, the higher benefit is from my current pension from the Teachers Association. So you, what I, I would probably recommend is find out what his find out what you would be eligible for in a spousal benefit, in a widow's benefit from us, if you don't already know. Okay. okay? And then from there, um, and you can reach out to your local office. You can reach out to our 800 number, 800-772-1213, and they can do the math for you. But from there, um, you can determine if two-thirds your monthly gross pension from the state is going to exceed that benefit or be less than that benefit. And if it's less than, you're going to get something from us. But if it's more, you won't. Okay. Okay. But I would definitely inquire. Potentially, you are eligible for something. Potentially. Uh, but you'd, we, we'll have to crunch the numbers to see if we can actually pay something out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just as another reminder, we're on the line with Kevin Reno from the Social Security Administration. If you would like to get in the queue to ask a question, just press star 3 on your phone's keypad. Ted, who do we have next? Why don't we go to Elsie? She's calling us from Fall River. Hello, Elsie. Yes, Hello, Elsie. hi. Hi. So my question is, my husband does construction, and he does take out um, a weekly fee for the Social Security. Now, because he's in the construction union, he can retire early and get his union retirement check. Now, when he becomes full age of retirement and it's time mm -hmm. to collect Social Security, will he be able to get his uh, full pension, or will a chunk be uh, taken out because he's collecting from the construction union? Right. Elsie, great question. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> in this instance, as long as he has been paying, I'm going to imagine he's paying SICA in this instance, but maybe FICA, either way, as long as he's paying taxes to Social Security on his earnings, right, and that pension is part of all of that. It's rolled into all of that. His Social Security will not, be, will not fall into the windfall. It's only when an individual is paying into what's considered a non-covered pension, meaning when they get paid every two weeks, week, month, whatever it may be, they're not paying into Social Security FICA or Social Security SICA. FICA is the Federal Insurance Contribution Act. SICA is the Self-Employed Contribution Act, but at the end of the day, it's taxes. As long as your husband is paying into Social Security on his earnings, then this pension uh, retirement fund will have no bearing. So if you have, like, you know, a Roth IRA or uh, 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 other forms of retirement, but you're paying taxes on your earnings, we don't care about those pensions. They do not offset. It's only these non-covered pensions where the individual is not paying FICA or SICA. Um, some individuals will say, well, I'm, I'm paying FICA, uh, but it's Medicare FICA. And that's a little bit different. You're not paying into Social Security. You're paying into Medicare. You have to be paying into Social Security FICA in order to not be windfall or have to deal with the government pension offset. So it doesn't sound to me like he would fall into that windfall category, no. Okay, perfect. Thank you so very much, and you have an awesome day. You too. Thank you. Uh, Ted, who do we have up next? Let's go to Mary. She's calling us from Brookline. Hello, Mary. Hello. Hi, Mary. How you doing? Ma Mary, is there? Yes, hello. Yeah. How can I help you? What's going on? Oh, I was just wondering about moving back to Canada, if I would be able to collect Social Security from here if I move up there. <laughs> um, yes, you can. Our, our benefits are transferable internationally for most countries, um, of which I believe Canada is one. 
Um, right. You can certainly double check with your local office, but I do. We have. I, I know we have plenty of recipients who live in Canada and collect a benefit from us. Um, right. But there are some countries out there that do not participate. We we cannot send a check to. Oh um, yeah. Could off they the top of my head, it? I can just. Could they deposit yeah. it just to a bank here, and I could get it from the bank here? <laughs> How you, how you do that is entirely up to you, but I do know we, we can send checks to Canada. It's countries like, for instance, I think North Korea and, say, Iran, where we have uh, – Oh, yeah. It would be impossible for us – there's no bank for us to get the check to. Sure. Um, those countries you couldn't, but most countries you can. Yeah, Canada would think be the easy one. <laughs> I would imagine. But, yeah, yeah. You, I'm, I'm, well, Canada, well, you, can, you can live abroad and, and still receive a check in most well, instances. And if you question it, if you do question if you are going to move abroad, um, I do again, 800-772-1213, call or your local office and just say, hey, I'm moving to X. Um, hey. Is my check going to be able to get delivered there? And they will be able to look up and make sure it's a participating country. Great. But yeah, Thanks. Canada should be fine. Very, very informative program. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great day now. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy yeah. Canada. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for calling in, and thanks for your question. Ted, who do we have next? Why don't we go to Robert? He's calling from Mansfield. Hello, Robert. Hi there. How are you? Thanks for taking my call. All right, here goes. I just uh, started receiving Social Security in February, and everything. I have direct deposit. Everything's been great. Everything's good. Now, I just received a letter from Social Security, Medicare Premiums. And I knew I was paying the 174, that's kind of standard, but I got the surcharge, the IRMAA, for 69.9. And I know that's because I worked all last year, plus overtime, plus capital gains, the whole shebang, plus I inherited some money, so I'm way over the threshold. My question is that's probably not going to change for 2024. I will have no W 2 at all, it'll just be my interest and and very small money elsewhere other than Social Security and a pension. Does that get readjusted? Do I do anything? Do I sit tight? What can you tell me? Sure. So um, what Rob is talking about is back in 2003, the Medicare Modernization Act was passed. Pardon me. And this changed kind of the Medicare landscape. The most important thing that it did was it basically invented Medicare Part D, which is prescription drug coverage through Medicare. Prior to that, there really was no prescription coverage via Medicare. Uh, one of the other things that it did was it implemented this Medicare Part B um, surcharge. And so for most individuals, anybody on Medicare Part B, which is your outpatient Medicare, there is a base premium. And that base premium fluctuates year over year. Traditionally, it goes up. Occasionally, it goes down. Sometimes it stays the same. But for this year, it's 174.70. That's the base. And what this Medicare Modernization Act did back in 03 was it said, okay, hey, listen, if you make a little bit more money, you may have to pay a little bit more in Medicare. Okay? Specifically, if you're looking at your tax form, and I do not know the line off the top of my head on your tax form, but it's honing in on the modified adjusted gross income from your tax form. If that value is high, you may pay a bit more. And so the first level or so, it's If it's an individual with a modified adjusted gross income of 103 or less, or a married couple with a modified adjusted gross income of 206, 206,000 or less, you're paying a base premium. Individuals 103 to 129, they're getting the 6960, or a married couple at 206 to 258, they're getting an additional 6990 added to their Medicare Part B base premium. And that number goes up. It, it can top out at anybody making greater than a, mil, a half a mil. Um, they're getting their base premium plus $419. $419. So to your question, Rob, what's going to happen is if you're getting hit with that surcharge right now, that means it, it's a two-year look back. So we are looking at your earnings, your modified adjusted gross income from 2022. Next year, we'll be looking at your modified adjusted gross income from 2023. In 2026, we'll be looking at your modified adjusted gross income as reported on your taxes from 2024. So if that number remains high in all of those years, you're going to continue to have this surcharge. And if the number begins to fluctuate, the surcharge will begin to fluctuate. 
understandably, because it's a two-year look back, a lot can happen in two years. So this is something that you can appeal, but you have to have one of eight life-changing events. And these are things like loss of work, loss of a spouse, loss of a pension, loss of an income-generating property, and there are a few more, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but if you have one of these eight life-changing events that is going to drastically drop down that modified adjusted gross income, you can submit the appeal to us, and we can recalculate it. So let's say in 2022 you had a very, very high modified adjusted gross income, but then in 2023 you lost, you left your job or something happened, and that, that income was going to be lower in 2023. In that instance there, you could file the appeal with us. We would recalculate it based on the 2023 modified adjusted gross income, even if it's an estimate, and your surcharge would be reduced to be in line with what you're actually at. So I think you said that it sounds like your modified adjusted gross income is going to be roughly the same for the next few years, which means okay, you can you count on kind of having this in place until that number, that value begins to decrease. I think you nailed it on every bit. So just to fine tune it a little bit. 2023, yep. uh, 2022, I did very well um, W2-wise plus everything in my investments. So that was high. 2023 was the worst, meaning I had made the most and I got inheritance money. So 2023, last year, was the final year. Now, this year, 2024, presently, just about everything is gone. I have no W-2, so I have no income. That's going to drop substantially. You know, I made almost ninety thousand, a hundred grand a year ago. So that's going to be gone, and then the inheritance won't be there. So it's this year. I know you throw out a lot of years, two year look back. So this is the year that when I go to do taxes next year, I'm going to be back in line. So what do I do then next year when I go to my tax person or Social Security? Or do we still have the two year look back? Do I do one of the eight items, or where is it there? So next year when you go to do your taxes, for our purposes, we're not going to catch next year's taxes until 2026, okay? Because, again, it's that two-year look back. So when we're in 2025, we're going to look at 2023, and so it sounds like that was a good year for you. Yes. That means what you would probably want to do next year, um, the form you're looking for, if you go to our website, socialsecurity.gov, and you type in form SSA4444, that's the IRMA surcharge appeal form and it lists right on it the eight potential life-changing events of which one has to occur for us to do a recalculation outside of that two-year look back window assuming you have one of those next year okay we could use that to use the 2024 numbers in advance and recalculate your benefits i would recommend and i've said this a couple times you're going to want to call 800 800- 772-1213 at that time, kind of go over the scenario with the representative, uh, and they'll point you in the best direction on how to file that appeal, if you're even going to be able to file the appeal, um, and take it from there. But worst case scenario, you don't have a, one of the light changing events, this will eventually flush itself out come, say, 2026, when we're looking back at 2024. But a loss of income does not fall under the one of eight items, correct? Like once you go from a hundred grand down to zero, does that is that play into account of the eight items or so? Like that's a drastic change compared to working and making uh, say seventy five, eighty five, a hundred grand, and then I understand with everything it pushes me in another bracket. But that yeah. bracket ended December thirty first. Is that one of the eight where I could appeal or no? It all hinges on the why. Okay. Why was the income lost? Was it loss of an income generating property? Was it loss of a job, loss of a pension, loss of a spouse who was working? As I said, I do not have the form up here in front of me at the moment, so I apologize, but it depends on how the income was lost. It's just really retirement. So I retired. That's it. Yeah. So potentially retirement is one of the categories. So okay. potentially, yes. So like I said, come 2025, I'd reach yep. out to a rep and let them know, you know, based on retirement, I've lost X amount of income. Um, I'd like to try to appeal this, and they'll walk you through that process. You can also contact your local office um, yep. or the 800 number. Either will be more than happy to help you out. Awesome. Very good. Boy, that was one of my to-do lists, and I just crossed it off now. Great job. I appreciate that. No worries. Best of luck.
Thanks, Robert. Uh, and thanks, Kevin. We have time for just one more question. I know we have more people in the queue. I'm really uh, sorry for that, but we will make sure you have all the information of where to get uh, more answers at the end of the program. But Ted, who's our last question going to? Let's go to Claire. She's in Raina. Hello, Claire. Hello. Thanks for taking my call. I'm glad I was one of those in the queue. Um, I've been listening for quite a while, so a lot of my questions have been answered. But what I want to know is that I'm 91 years old. I'll be 92 in October, and I'm working two days a week. And when I retired at 65, I went to work full-time for another company. The company that I was working for prior to my retirement, I got a pension. But I'm not concerned about my pension as I am my Social Security. Because I'm still working and paying into Social Security, shouldn't it go up every year? Claire, that is a fabulous last question. Thank you for asking. And happy upcoming birthday. Oh, um, thank you so much. God's been good. Out, but, yeah, yeah. but that is an excellent last question. And I'm thank a widow. Well, asking. I was divorced, but now I'm a widow. Okay, yeah. And my husband at that. the time when we got divorced he was a firefighter, so I'm sure that he was not paying into Social Security. He was working for the city. Yeah, he was. So I never touched. I never even looked at it because I figured I was still working, and that you know my income would be my income for Social Security would be higher. Well, you might want to just poke around and see if your income from Social Security was significantly higher. Again, you know you're going to run into government pension offset and stuff like that, but it that might be worth it. Usually. Usually when we take an application from someone, though, we, are, we explore every avenue of eligibility. So when someone sat down with you when you retired, they're gonna, hopefully they asked you about your spouse, um, and they would have explored right then and there if there was any type of potential additional benefit. Because we, uh, we try to the best of our ability to make sure we award someone every possible benefit and the maximum possible benefit that we can afford them. To your question with regards to work, the short answer is yes. If you retire and if you continue to work, you could potentially see an increase in your benefits. And the reason I say potentially is this. When we calculate out your Social Security benefits, how we do it is we basically look at your earnings record and we add up, we average out your highest 30 years worth of work. Okay. Okay. So let's say, so you retired, and when you retired, we looked at your highest 30 years worth of work as of right then and there, and we awarded you a benefit. And then let's say the next year you went and you worked and you filed taxes. Well, what happens is when those taxes come into us, when our good friends over at the IRS report to us that, um, that Claire has been working, we're going to go, cool, let's see what she submitted for uh, Social Security tax, okay. and then we're going to pull up your list your 30 years that we had used to figure out your benefit. And we're going to go, hey, does this new set of earnings exceed one of her low years? One of the years when maybe somebody had like a paper route and they were paying taxes or they worked, they worked somewhere, you know, when you were a teenager, one of those jobs you first had, you're right. paying, you know, bottom line into Social Security. Do these new earnings impact? Can they, can they replace one of the low years? And if they do, then we swap the numbers out. Now, here's the thing. Most likely, in most instances, those jobs that you get post-retirement, and this isn't always true, but they're not usually paying as much as the jobs you had pre-retirement. True. And so what happens is the, the flip, if we move the earnings around a little bit, you'll see a slight increase, but it's not usually jaw-dropping in its, in its value because – your earnings, it's just usually those post-retirement earnings are less than the pre-retirement earnings. Yes. Usually. Not always. But, like, again, the short answer to your question is yes. We will, every year, post-retirement, if you continue to work and continue to pay into the system, we will always recalculate your benefit and, whenever possible, increase your benefit based on that recalculation. Does my pension affect my Social Security? If you paid into Social Security while you worked, absolutely not. Okay, great. I've always paid, since I've been 15, I've always paid into Social Security. 
Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. I've been listening and got a lot of good information uh, while waiting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great one. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone who called in and participated in this Social Security Teletown Hall. Uh, we loved all of your questions. If we weren't able to get to your question, you can at obtain valuable information from our Social Security Resource Center, which you can access at aarp.org slash youearnedit or by calling one 448 3621 And I know Kevin... First of all, thank you so much for the great information you shared uh, and uh, for joining from the Social Security Administration. And please give us um, the website and the phone number again where people can get more infor information directly from SSA. Sure. The website is going to be ssa.gov. Um, it's an amazing resource for anything you may need pertaining to your own Social Security or just general information regarding what it is we do. The phone number is going to be 800-772-1213. That's our national 800 number. They're open Monday through Friday, 7 to 7. Excellent. Kevin Reno, Regional Public Affairs Specialist for the Social Security Administration. It's been a pleasure working with you and your team on events throughout Massachusetts. Um, this has been an excellent call. And for all of you still on the line, if you'd like to hear more about events going on here in Massachusetts, you can access that at aarp.org Massachusetts. Have a great day.